Janet for leading us in prayer. Uh, as you can tell, prayer is quite an important component for Discovery Church. Not only do we uh, take requests here on Sunday morning, but we also take them midweek uh, during our prayer service, which is live on Facebook. And uh, if you are interested in having people pray for you in the middle of the week or with whatever's going on in your life, just stop in, even just for five minutes, uh, or pray with us for the whole hour. Uh, we continue on in the series called Revelation, How Will It All End? And last Sunday, uh, we started with, yes, what was I? Lights flaring on the table, that work? Mm, <laughs> Need to pull a curtain. <laughs> 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 How's that? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> my eyes thank you. I know I'm good on the eyes because my wife wants to look at me. <laughs> We talked a little bit about the state of things in heaven and how worship happens. We talked about the holiness of God and, and how uh, even at the end of the service, we felt the holiness of God when we were here. And there was a time of confession and prayer that needed to happen uh, because we were in the presence of a holy God. And today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into the next part of the book of Revelation, which is probably... Uh, maybe one of the most interesting pieces, or uh, maybe one of the most controversial pieces, but certainly one of the hardest uh, passages to prepare. Um, as a pastor, we're talking about the wrath of God, and that's a hard subject to talk about, right? We, we love to talk about the, the loving nature of God. We love to talk about His compassion and mercy, but we don't often take the time to think about the fact that at some point in the future, we are all going to be held accountable before God. We're going to stand before Him and have to give account of everything that we have done. Uh, one, one of the most disturbing movies that I have ever seen was Francis Ford Coppola's classic on the Vietnam War, Apocalypse Now. The film tracks an American officer as he goes uh, in country to try and uh, find and assassinate a rogue, a renegade commander who was held, held up and holed up in, in this inaccessible region in Vietnam. So the American officer forges deep into the battleground and he tries to find this renegade commander. He arrives at this remote outpost, this setting where bombs are flying, men are being blown apart, uh, bullets are flying, and all of the soldiers have at that moment in time, because of the intensity of the war, this crazed look in their eyes where it could only be described as insanity. The scene is out of Dante's Inferno. It's literally hell on earth. And the uh, officer says to the other people there, who's in charge here? And, and no one can answer the question. It's probably one of the most awful things that I've seen on television as far as moving me emotionally, and it was just horrible. And if we're not careful, when we talk about the wrath of God, we can get into that place of hopelessness around the nature of God and how his wrath is poured out. Who's in charge is the question that we still need to ask. Because if no one's in charge, then we're going to hell in a handbasket. Thankfully, we have a Savior, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, who's in charge. Now, many observers would look at the world around us, and they would say we are truly going to hell because of what we are doing to the planet, to what we're doing to each other, to the wars that are happening around the globe, uh, the disasters that are being followed not only by human hands, but certainly by natural means as well. It seems as though things are crashing in around us. Chapter 4 and 5, uh, we took a look at what it was like in heaven, and we gave glory to God as the angels and the elders bowed down and worshipped Him. 
And in chapter 6, as we're going to take a look at in just a minute, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are unleashed upon the earth. Now we try to find a lot of meaning in the nature of these four riders. The four riders who unleash destruction. And for our purposes here today, one of the things that we're going to do is we're just going to focus on them as bringers of destruction. Uh, there are, you know, more books, I've said this to you last time, more books written on the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible. And so everyone's got an opinion about who or what each of the four writers are. But let's just keep it to its a basic intent, which is it's about the destruction of the world. The rider on the white horse is representing sin and conquest. The red horse stands for warfare and bloodshed. The black horse for famine and pestilence. The pale green horse for the color of death and the grave. And it is Jesus who's in control. <coughs> it is Jesus who opens the scroll. Remember from last time we talked about how John wept because no one was worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. And the angel said, look, there is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He is worthy to open the scrolls. And if he isn't going to open the scroll, then history cannot be unfolded the way it's supposed to be. That resolution and restoration can't happen unless the seals are open. And unless the wrath of God is poured out. Billy Graham said this about the four horsemen. He said, the four horsemen are God's picture to warn us of our own sinfulness. They don't cause evil. They are a picture of a very human process. What the four horsemen do, or at least we are capable of doing, is to model what we do. And the meaning of this is that we need to repent of our sins and come before God. We've got to remember that the book of Revelations was written to a group of Christians in Rome who were just about ready to deal with Nero and the burning of the city, of Domitian, who would uh, put Christians uh, in an arena and allow lions to toy with them. He would plant them on a stake and tar them with tar and light them on fire as lamps as people came into the city. This persecution wasn't at its fullest yet when John wrote this, but it was about to come. And John writes this letter to them so that they know that there is someone in control of the universe, that we are not going to hell in a handbasket. That God is out there, and his sovereignty is absolute. And when sin is left to go rampant in the world like the horsemen let loose on the planet... There will be suffering. But I got quiet in here. As far as the wicked are concerned, Revelation teaches that it is Jesus himself who will judge and be the executor of the judgments that will come. Let me begin by reading to you from Revelation chapter 6. As I watched, says John, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. The Lamb, Jesus, breaks the seals. He is still sovereign and in control. And then I heard one of the four living beings saying with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked up and I saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on its head. And he rolled out to win many battles and gain victory. And when the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. And then a horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. Then the lamb broke the third seal. And I heard the third living being say, Come. I looked up and I saw a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in its hands. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, a loaf of wheat bread or loaves of barley will cost a whole day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and the wine that you have. And when the lamb broke the fourth seal, 
I heard the fourth living being say, come. And I looked up and I saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death, and his companion was the grave. And these two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. It's hard to imagine the wrath of God, right? Because most times when we think about wrath, someone's wrath, we think of anger. We put the two together, right? When that 200-pound man throws a 100-pound woman across the room. When a mother beats her child because he spilled a glass of milk. We think of that wrath as being attached to anger. But I want you to see this. I want you to imagine this with me. This is all of our sin. And here I have a match, and I'm just going to light this match. And what happens when I light this match? Well, this represents the holiness of God. And if I put these two together, I can stand here without wrath, without anger, pardon me, without malice, and allow the nature of these two combustibles to interact. That the holiness of God will take out the sin that is present. Now, I could have easily lit this on fire. But the purpose of God's wrath is not so that his anger is satisfied. The purpose of God's wrath is to deal with sin in the world. That sin needs to be extinguished. That the holiness of God will overtake everything that is sinful and wipe it out. So when the four horsemen of the apocalypse are let loose upon the planet, it's not so much that God's anger is poured out, but rather his wrath or his cleansing of the world is being taken place. And for most of the things that happen, we just don't understand why that would have to be. We think to yourself, can God just, you know, can, can, take over and, and, and just knock out all of the evil in the world. And we struggle with that. Why, is, why can't God do that? Because if God did that, then there would be no true relationship with us and Him. Because in order for me to truly love someone, I have to have the choice not to. In order for me to truly love you, I have to make the choice to be kind to you and to be compassionate and loving to you. In order for me to truly love this planet, I have to have the choice to either take care of it or destroy it. In order for me to truly love the cultures around the world, the people who are different than me, I have to have the choice to hate them. The wrath of God is poured out And then we have the fifth seal. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge the blood of that for what they have done to us? And then a white robe was given to each one of them. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. In the 16th and 17th century, the most popular book that was written, besides the Bible, was written by a man named John Fox. Uh, this is not an original, obviously, but uh, this is a copy of what he wrote. It's called Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. It was the most famous book in the 16th, the 15th and 16th century, and the 17th century, most printed, most read around the world. It is a collection of stories of the martyrs that have died for their faith in Jesus. To be a martyr means to uh, stand for your faith publicly, and in the face of persecution and even death, refuse to recount your faith before others. And it led many to burning at the stake, beheading, 
torture. Even the Romans that, that John was writing to would one day feel the wrath of Domitian and Nero. These saints under the, the altar of God are crying out to him when the fifth seal is broken and opened and they cry out to God and say, how long must we wait until justice is done? Until those that have persecuted are going to get what they deserve, O oh Lord. And for those people who had heard this, for those Christians all throughout the centuries who have gone into a place of faith where their faith was tested, even to the point of death, this must have given them some sense of hope. That there is a place where people go when they are martyred. That there's a place that is free from the pain that they experience. That God is still in control. Jesus breaks the seal and reminds us that he's in control. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, uh, not only do we have the Fox's book of Christian martyrs, but in the book of Hebrews, we have the uh, story of the heroes of faith in chapter 11. And at the end of the chapter 11, in verse uh, 35, it says, But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were even sawed in half. And others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. You know, it's not surprising that people are persecuted for the faith. What's surprising to me is that most of us will never be persecuted. Because the story of the book of Revelation is that when you are called to be a follower of Christ, the world will stand against you. That there will be people who want to see you literally suffer for your faith. Now we can argue in our day today that we certainly do suffer for our faith, but certainly not to the extent that I'm describing here. See, martyrs are told to wait a little longer because not all the martyrs are yet in heaven. That scares me. In verse 12, and I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was great earthquake, and the sun became dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and the islands were moved from their place. Now let's not forget that this is a dream, a vision. Right, So the stars aren't literally going to fall from the sky, but calamities and death and destruction and famines and uh, natural disasters, all of these things could be described this way. When the two planes fell into the two towers and into the Pentagon, when the Second World War was described later on, we could have said that the heavens fell, that all that was beautiful and good seemed to come to an end. And then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the mountain caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to survive? It's a difficult thing to read to. That there will come someday the moment where the wrath of God is poured out on all mankind. Six of the seven seals are opened. 
But the seventh seal has not yet been. In chapter 7, Then I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so that they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying a seal of the living God. And he shouted to those four east, carrying the seal, those four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Wait, don't harm the land and the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the forehead of his servants. Ah, there's a reprieve. In the cosmic dream that John is dreaming and sharing for us, one that shows us the beginning and the end, uh, and it's not clearly a timeline from one moment to another, but there is a moment when the angel will come and say, we must put the seal on the heads of those who are followers of Jesus. And I heard how many they marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. 12 from this one, and Judah, uh, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, 12,000 from each. And after this, I saw a vast crowd from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of this realm before the Lamb, and they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. For those Christians who were waiting for the time when the suffering would come, when the potential for them to become martyrs of the faith were about to happen, this is the moment in which they would have rejoiced and said, but God is willing to rescue us. Salvation means to come and rescue. God rescues us by putting his seal on us. When you were baptized as a child or when you were baptized as an adult, your baptism was a sign and a seal. It marked you as Christ's own. You are his. And nothing, anything, anyone in this world can take that away from you. And that crowd praised God saying, salvation has come. It's come from the God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. You know, a lot's been said about this 144,000 over the years. And here again, I'm not going to get into all of those different ideas, let alone to say that this is a full number, a number that describes you and me, that every one of us is who is a follower of Jesus, all of us, not one is going to be left out, that we, each one of us who follow Jesus, will be sealed. Amen. And that we have salvation. And the crowd right next to it says the crowd was so great that no one could even count. I don't imagine that's 144,000. I imagine that's millions and even billions of us across the planet. The point of this passage, the point of this passage between the fifth, or between the sixth and the seventh seal, is to affirm that even though evil must be allowed to come to its full height in order for this to eventually be fully and finally overthrown, God will not allow this process to be put in jeopardy. The rescue of his people will happen. And no doubt the events around this might be terrifying. But you could rest assured that you are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Now I thought I would stop here and just talk a little bit about those saints, those martyrs under the altar, those multitudes that cried out, salvation belongs to us. Because there's a relationship that maybe you're not seeing between here and in heaven, about who has gone before you and left this place and this planet is now with God in heaven. And there's some clues here, one of some very small clues, but there are clues here about what it's like for those who have gone before. Some of them are people who have been uh, martyred for their faith, certainly, and they have a special place in God's kingdom. But for those who follow Jesus, 
There's a few things that I want you to notice. First of all, when people die on earth, they relocate to heaven. The multitudes are there with Jesus now. They stand before God and say, how long, Lord, will you let the injustices go on? Don't we pray something similar here from the book of Psalms? Lord, how long are you going to let the, the wicked prosper? The people in heaven were the same ones killed for Christ on earth. And basically, that means that they understand that they what they did on earth, they understood that in heaven. So they're not mindless. They know where they came from. They understand what happened in their life. And they're able to testify about that in heaven. People in heaven are going to be remembered for their lives on earth. I don't know, you've got someone that you love, someone close to you that's gone on to heaven. A child that you've lost, a parent, a grandparent, a friend. Isn't it good to know that they will remember their lives here on earth and testify about their life in heaven to Jesus? They call out to God. They have a conversation with him. They learn in heaven because if they don't know why Jesus has not yet done what he needs to do, they're asking him why they need to wait. And he says, because not all of the martyrs are yet here. We have to wait longer until the full number is ready. And so people in heaven are not just sitting on a cloud playing a violin or strumming a harp. Uh, they're learning and growing. People in the present heaven can raise their voices to God. Rational, conscious thoughts, communication, emotion, passions. Martyrs are fully conscious. And God, they ask God to intervene on your behalf. Now, so many times I've heard people say to me, well, I hope that my loved one is intervening for me in heaven. I can tell you with absolute authority from the scripture that those who have gone before you into heaven sit before God and have the opportunity to plead on your behalf, to speak to him about the people that they love, to look down on earth and know and see that there is still things going on that break their heart and that they can come before Jesus on your behalf and plead for you. Those in heaven have a deep concern for justice and for God's wrath to become upon those who are evil in the world. They remember their lives here on earth and God answers their questions. God has some promises even that he wants to fulfill for those martyrs. When they say that they have to wait a little longer, God says, my plan will come to its ultimate conclusion. The promise is that things will be fulfilled. And the people on earth, the people of God, pardon me, in heaven, have a strong family connection with those of us here on earth. Verse 11 from chapter 7. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings, and they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped God, saying, and they sang, it says, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and strength belong to God forever and ever. And then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these are that are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And John said to him, sir, uh, you're, you're the one who knows. And then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation." They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve Him night and day in the temple. And He who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the Lamb is on the throne and He is now their shepherd. And He will lead them to springs of life-giving water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Could you imagine the person in the midst of persecution reading these words moments before they died, knowing that Jesus was on his throne, that he is still God in the midst of the evil of this world? 
and that he promised them no more pain, no more tears, that he would be their shelter, their shepherd, and he would wipe every tear from their eyes. These communities were facing a nightmare, a nightmare, something beyond we could never imagine. The evil in parts of this world still bring about the same kind of nightmare for many believers. I said to you last time, more believers have died for their faith in the last 100 years than in all the centuries combined. Evil is still around. And the book of Revelation tells us this story. Number one, that God's people are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. They are saved. Salvation is theirs. Not one of them will be left out. But they will suffer. And secondly, that the wrath of God is not poured out upon believers. It is poured out upon those who persecute those who follow Jesus and who ignore the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Lord God, let this promise from Revelation remind us of the privileged position that we have in this space today, this morning, as we come before you in front of the holiness of God, that we are saved and sealed by the promise of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Lord, help us to be thankful and give thanks for all that that entails. But Lord, our heart breaks for those who don't know you. Lord, help us to be witnesses to those who have yet to hear, to proclaim the message for those who are yet to be brought in to the kingdom of God. We pray, God, that you would give us courage to stand our ground when we face opposition. Certainly nothing like the early church had to deal with, Lord, but there are times when we fear for ourselves, for our families. We're praying, God, that you would go with us. Give us courage. In Jesus' name, amen.